My name is Pastor Caleb Kerbis. Along with Pastor Paul Zell, we are encouraged to be able to bring you God's Word today. As you can see just in this small screen frame, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, with lights and trees and decorations both inside and outside of our houses and sanctuaries, we're getting ready. We're getting ready to celebrate that first time that Jesus came at Christmas. We also are preparing our hearts for that time when he will most certainly come again. For we, whom God has prepared to live forever, for eternity, we get our souls ready, we, we get our hearts ready, which is far more significant than just cooking and decorating, although those are important. And so throughout this Advent season, we're focusing in on God's word and we're seeing how God is an up-close and personal kind of God. He takes out the magnifying glass of sorts and he zooms in on these various blessings that he has prepared for us. Today, magnified joy. That even though we have this pensive anticipation for Christmas and also that time when Jesus comes again, God comes to us through his word and through his sacraments to give us this joy that exceeds and a joy that even excels in a life that can sometimes be challenged by this world. May God bless our worship in his name today. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The Apostle Paul was inspired to say the, these words. Here's a trustworthy saying which deserves full acceptance. I am the chief of sinners. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst, he says. And we, with even a modicum of honesty, can recognize our own sinfulness. God therefore invites us to come before him to confess our sinfulness, trusting in the merits and mercy of Jesus Christ, our Savior, for forgiveness, pardon, and eternal peace. Let us pause now and quietly confess our sins, trusting in our Savior's love and forgiveness. God demonstrated his unlimited patience in preparing the pathway for his Savior so that we would receive this incredible love and by faith that he creates in our hearts would believe in Jesus and receive forgiveness, pardon, and eternal peace. Therefore, it is by Christ's command and with his authority that I say to you what God says to you. Your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you pour out your peace into our hearts that we would be filled with joy that comes from above. For as your Son set aside the crown of heaven in order to endure the cross and its shame, having risen from the dead and now reigning with you, we have this eternal peace through him and will receive our crown on the last day. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. The Old Testament reading from Zephaniah chapter 3. The Old Testament reading from Zephaniah chapter 3. Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. A reading from Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The Word of the Lord. The Gospel for today, Luke chapter 3. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. 
And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has one, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord is near, so says Jesus' forerunner. John is standing at the, on the bank of the Jordan River Desperate souls are flocking to him from many miles around. They know that the Lord is holy, holy, holy. They realize that he is aware of every wrongdoing of which they've been guilty. They know that God is fully aware of their greed and their selfishness and their, their dishonesty and taking advantage of others. They're fully aware of that. And they're turning away from their sins. They're repenting and being baptized at the Jordan for the forgiveness of sins. But there's more. The Lord is near, John says. He's near in this way that his axe is already at the root of the fruitless fruit tree. And if your life has been fruitless before God and worthless before others, he's ready to, to chop you down and throw you into the, the fire that never goes out. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he's, he's gathering his precious wheat into his barn. But if you've been worthless straw, if you've been like those husks of grain, that chaff that has no value at all, if practically speaking, you have not been serving your God or your fellow human beings, then yeah, you'll be burned up in unquenchable fire. So what should we do, they asked John. What should we do, we ask. John's answer, share with those who have less than you. Do your work Honestly, be fair to others. Do not take advantage of them. Be content with your income. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance and baptism for the forgiveness of sins. That's what you should do. The Lord is near. So says the Old Testament prophet. He goes by the name Zephaniah. He's been serving as the Lord's spokesman to the people of Jerusalem. The Lord is near, he says. So what should we do, they ask. His first listeners wonder. Zephaniah answers, this is what you should do. You should rejoice. You should shout God's praises. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart. But don't otherwise let your hands hang limp at your side doing nothing in response to that. No. Use your hands to work for others. Use your hands to give, to share, to, to make others' lives as, as rich in blessing as yours have been. But don't do that out of fear. Don't do that from worry. Through the service and sacrifice of the Lord Jesus, 
The Lord has taken away your punishment. In love, he will no longer rebuke you, the prophet says. You and I know from the Bible and from the circumstances we observe in the world that the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ is drawing near. In fact, if you pour over the scriptural evidence, the things that Jesus said, what his apostles foretold had to happen, as far as we know, it may already have all happened. The Lord is near with his return to to separate the wheat from the chaff, with his threat to to chop down the fruitless fruit tree, those whose lives have been unproductive before the Lord. Sometimes then we need to hear from John, we fallible human beings who get a little comfortable, a little complacent, a little lazy. We need to hear of the Lord's threat to cut down and to burn up. Sometimes we need to hear from the prophet prophet Zephaniah that we do have reason to rejoice and be glad and give thanks to the Lord that, that he'll no longer rebuke us for our sins. And sometimes, no, pretty much all the time, we need to hear from the Apostle Paul. The words that we're considering this morning in particular are words from a a scripture passage that really should be highlighted in everybody's personal Bible. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. The Apostle speaking just like John and just like Zephaniah telling us exactly what we should do because the Lord is near. For instance, someone insults you. Someone causes trouble for you or or someone that you care about. Someone tries to deprive you of your good name. Someone is, is looking to rob you of the positive frame of mind that you have. Responses to that, I don't even have to suggest how a person could respond to all that. Except this, what the apostle urges. When that happens, have the mind of Christ Jesus. Keep Christ Jesus in mind who, who patiently has, has, has been very kind to you and me when we have wronged him. Have the mind of Christ who responded to those who caused trouble with him for him by not cursing them, but, but urging upon them the blessings of repentance. When you represent the mind of Christ to others, then Paul's words, let your gentleness, your large heartedness be evident to all. Your large heartedness and your desire to forgive just as Christ forgives. After all, the Lord is near. Okay, but what if those who trouble you become more troublesome? What if the things that are shaking up your equilibrium right now start shaking it up even more? What if there's an illness that doesn't get better, an injury that's not healing? What if, what if you're losing your ability to see or to hear or to walk? What if you're losing your ability to, to think clearly, to process clearly? What if something terrible happens to someone who's near and dear? What if the bad becomes worse? The apostle's response of what we should do. He writes, do not be anxious about anything. Instead, in everything, in the big concerns and the little concerns, in in the chronic everyday troubles and in the trouble that just came new this past week, in in, in the difficulties that you share with others and in those that are personally yours that perhaps nobody you know of is dealing with, In every circumstance, present your requests to God. Or like Jesus said, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking at his door. Keep praying about that. Keep casting your cares about the Lord because he cares for you. 
Keep bringing to him your petitions, your requests, because the Lord is honored to hear them. Pray already with the thanksgiving that the Lord not only will hear, but will respond with that which is eternally good for you and for others. Do not be anxious about any, anything, the apostle writes, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Because the Lord is near. I've seen it many, many times in a newspaper, in a magazine. You've probably seen it as well. The single frame cartoon. In the middle of the frame stands a, a, a man on a busy city street. Pedestrians going back and forth in front of him. The man has this long hair cascading over his shoulders like he hasn't cut it in years. His unkempt beard is down below his, the, the middle of his chest. He's, he's wearing this, this long robe that he hasn't washed for years, sandals on his feet. And he's holding above him a sign, four words, the end is near. Kind of a doom and gloom prophet, right? Someone whose view of things is, is so dark, it, it, it borders on the ridiculous. It sounds like it might be biblical, but it's really not what we're hearing from the prophet Zephaniah. It's not what, what John the baptizer preached. It's certainly not what we're hearing from, from, from that that man at the Jordan who himself, his hair had never seen a razor, his beard unkempt. And it's not what we hear from the apostle whose own sandals were worn thin from, from walking the gospel all over the Mediterranean world. No, their message? Rejoice in the Lord always. Paul writes, I'll say it again, rejoice. Why? Four words. Could be on your sign and mine. The Lord is near. That's not the same as the doom and gloom of the street corner prophet. Nor is it the same as the, 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 the empty happiness that many of our acquaintances are, are trying to lasso and hang on to during these, these holiday weeks. It's not the same, perhaps, as what's being expressed by twinkling lights on someone's front lawn. And it might not be captured as, as you get together with coworkers at the company Christmas party or, or with family and friends in, at your home for the first time in, in two years. No, there's one place where real joy is found. You heard it. Rejoice in the Lord. In the Lord whose first advent the prophets eagerly anticipated. In the Lord whose kingdom John the baptizer and all the apostles announced. In the Lord who came with grace and truth. Rejoice in him. Rejoice in the Lord who humbled himself and became obedient unto death for you, even death on a cross. Rejoice in the Lord who, who every tongue will someday acknowledge as King of kings and Lord of lords. Rejoice in him. Rejoice in him whose birth the angels announced. Rejoice in his life of, of, of holy compassion and in his deeds of love. Rejoice in his once and for all sacrifice for sin. Rejoice in his victory over death. Rejoice that he's now ruling over all things for the good of his church. Rejoice in the Lord. And rejoice especially in this. From this very letter of the Apostle Paul, the previous passage to this, rejoice that our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Rejoice in the Lord. Sixteen times in this epistle, the apostle uses words for joy sixteen times. It's considered the, the, the most prominent feature of this epistle to the, to the Philippians. Which makes sense, doesn't it? Because joy is the distinctive feature of the life that finds its identity, identity in Christ Jesus. Yeah, but aren't we supposed to be sad about our self-centeredness and about our, our unwillingness to share, about our greed, about our inability to help sometimes when we want to, but we can't get ourselves to do it? Should we grieve over our sins and mourn over them? Yes, we should. Jesus said that, and we'll do that. But finally, all our sins have been covered by the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. So rejoice in the Lord. Yeah, but aren't we supposed to deny ourselves? Aren't we supposed to carry up our own cross as we confess the name of Jesus and endure the, the difficulties, the persecutions that go along with that? Yes, we are. Jesus said that, and we will. But Christian self-denial and carrying one's cross ultimately finds its joy in the one who purchased our salvation on his own cross. So even as we do that, we'll rejoice in the Lord. Yeah, but what about the notion that if you're pessimistic enough, you'll protect yourself from disappointment? Have you tried that? You know, don't get your hopes up too high because then, then the, the crushing disappointments won't hurt as much. Or how about taking pride in the fact that you above all people, you're smart enough to anticipate all the ways in which something can go wrong. Shouldn't we have that view of things? Yeah, we should. If we think like the world thinks. Yeah, we should if, if our eyes see only what our, if we see only what our physical eyes can see and 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 and, and think about only what our, what our human brain can comprehend. But you and I, we're guarded by the peace of God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, in the name of the one true and triune God, you have been baptized and adopted into the Heavenly Father's family. His one and only Son, God from God from eternity, is both fully human, conceived and born of the Virgin, and remains fully God. The Lord Jesus is, yep, he's glorious God and humbled human being at the same time. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the shepherd who keeps watch over his sheep. He's your lowly servant. He's your glorious heavenly King. He died for you. He lives for you. He's seated on his heavenly throne. He's always with you. He's preparing a place for you in heaven, even as he makes his home in your heart. That, dear believer, is the peace of God that guards both you and me. I, I might try to explain it, but I can never fully do so. You might try to comprehend it, and others as well, but they'll never fully grasp it. Still, it'll guard your faith and mine from doubt. It'll shield your thinking from pessimism and constant worry. In fact, the peace of God that you've been given is expressed in a in, in, a, in a promise that you probably know it by heart, right here in Philippians chapter two, chapter 4, verse 7. The Holy Spirit's words through the Apostle Paul, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, 
will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The Lord is near. Let your large-hearted, your big-hearted gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, but cast all your anxieties on the Lord in prayer. The Lord is near. Rejoice in the Lord. I, along with the Apostle Paul, will say it again. Rejoice. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, each day is a gift of your grace. Your mercies are new every morning. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your people that as we join to you in your word where you promise to be with us and strengthen us, we would be filled with exceeding joy, longing for that day when you will come again. Strengthen our country, the bond that we share with our fellow country people. Strengthen all of us in our homes. Lead us to be strong citizens, not only of this country, but also citizens of the heavenly kingdom, that we would reflect your grace to others. Hear us now also, Lord, as we bring to you every petition your Son has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Once again, thank you for being with us today. If you check out our website, lsavior.org, there are a lot of opportunities. We have an Advent project going on right now, a way to fill your season, not with busyness that will leave you empty, but with hope, joy, peace, and love. You can find that on our website or just go to lsavior.org slash Advent Project. Also, there are Bible studies, midweek gatherings for fellowship, for a supper, and also a devotion. We have our Christmas Eve and Christmas Day services all prepared as well in both locations. Please check out our upcoming Christmas schedule, and we hope to be able to gather around God's word with you all. God bless you all.